Traditionally, historically, today is Palm Sunday. If you were here Wednesday night, we did the dramatic countdown from Daniel chapter 9 to that very moment in time. God gave Daniel a calendar of time and he said from 483 years in which the moment you are standing, Messiah the King will come. And to the day, to the day Jesus rides into the town of Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. To the cries of Hosanna. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. And in token of celebration of that today. Don't leave here without your palm branch. They are in the foyer. Joe I believe you took some time to. To make that happen for us. And I appreciate your gift to the rest of us. To remind us. That Daniel's prophecy stands true. That the Messiah would indeed come. To the shouts. And the proclamations of a group of people. Who would only days later cry out these words. Crucify him. Crucify him. But as I began to think about. All the things that are happening. Churches everywhere. They will preach that sermon. Nothing wrong with that sermon. Nothing wrong with the Palm Sunday sermon. We're just not, we're not led by the calendar. I cannot preach all the sermons that are led by the calendar. You understand that? God is working in us. He's massaging our hearts and he's saying, I did ride into town just like Zechariah prophesied. Just like Daniel prophesied. I, I did do that. But God worked this question into me as I was preparing for this. What is a king without power? What is a king with no power? Isn't he just a guy in a fancy robe and a funny hat? And then he asked, God asked me an even deeper question than that. If a king with no power is just a man in a funny hat and a fancy robe... What is the church without power? And aren't we just an ornamented group just the same? Aren't we just like the Rotary Club? Aren't we just like any other group that meets? Has a group, has a following, has a, a purpose. But if we have not power, we're just an overdressed classroom. And with those stinging questions plaguing me, we can wave our palm branches and we can tell the world we have a king. But if we have not power, what more do we have to share with them? If we are not empowered, what are we really? Except a frustrated group of people who, knew, who know better but can't live it. Come on, is that the frustration of so many people? I know better, I just can't live it. I know what's right, it's right in front of me. I can read it in the word, I'm not stupid, I see it, I just can't do it. I want my friends, I want my family, I want them all to live it, but none of us can. And, and much of the church is stymied by powerless living. Powerless, moral, powerless. Knowing right, can't do it. I think we can. I literally think we human beings can move from doing church to being the church empowered by God. Not making up things to do. Boy, we can fill up a calendar, can't we? Churches are famous. Let's fill up the calendar from January to December. Let's just fill it with event after event after event after event. And then at the end of the year, we can all wipe our brow and say, Whew, that was tough. Or we can wipe the calendar clean and say, God, what do you want to do? What do you want to do with us? 
What do you want to do with Trinity Assembly of God meeting there in Nicholson, Pennsylvania? What says you, O oh God? And he'll say something like this. Launch out into the deep. A puzzle? We want power and you give us a puzzle? He'll say, like he did to Peter, launch out into the deep. I've been fishing all night. I've been... Launch out into the deep. You don't understand. I've been casting this net out into the water all night long. I'm tired. And besides, you're a rabbi. What do you know about fishing? Preach to us, yes. Tell me about fishing. No, I've been doing this my whole life. You see, we fish at night, rabbi. We fish at night so the fish don't see the net so that we can scoop them up. I've been out here all night. I've got nothing to show for it. And you say to me, launch out into the deep. Launch out into the deep. Don't you see the sun glistening on the sea? Don't you see that the sun has already come up, Rabbi? Teacher, don't you understand? The fish will see the net. And besides all that, if I... If I venture out in my boat now, if I venture out into the sea with my net now, and all the other fishermen are watching, I will be the laughing stock of the fishing industry. Because we just don't do it this way, Rabbi. You see, we just don't do things this way around here. Launch out into the deep. But we don't do it that way. Launch out into the deep. And if you were here for that Nevertheless series, one of the most profound Nevertheless comes out of this story found in Luke chapter 5. Nevertheless, because you say so, I'm going to do it. Because you say so, I'm going to do it. And if you read there in your Bible in Luke chapter 5, you'll find that Peter, against all odds and against his greater discernment of being a fisherman, takes his net, puts it back in his boat, rows out, drops his net, I'm sure in frustration. I'm not going to catch anything, but just so you're happy to make me an embarrassment, God, I'm going to do it. And he drops that net into the daylight water where all the fish can see and he gives it a tug. And it doesn't come out of the water. He gives it another tug because Peter's just that kind of guy. Tough, sharp. I, I can get this, he says. It must be stuck on a, a rock or something. And he gives it another tug and as he looks over the precipice of the boat, what does he see? The thing is just filled. The net is filled with fish. Filled. So much that the ones that were laughing on the shore at old Peter, he said, get out here. You're not going to believe this. It's filled. We have toiled all night on empty. And this rabbi says, do it this way. And now it's filled. And he gets his friends and they begin to pull that net into the boat. And scripture says that the net begins to tear from the weight within. They manage to get it in the boat and they drag it to shore and look at the bounty that lies before them. Non-traditional to say the least. You are that fisherman. 
You have said to the Lord, God, we don't, I don't do it this way. I, I, I just, God, I don't do it this way. And he's just simply whispering this phrase into your ear. Launch into the deep. Tradition says we, we just go to church on Sunday. You're just... If, if I do what you're asking me to do, God, I'll be the laughing stock of my family. I'll be the laughing stock of my friends. The co-workers I have, they'll just dismiss me totally. God, if I do this, if I launch out into the... I know what this means, God. Nevertheless, because you say so, I'm going to take a chance. You are that fisherman. And the spirit within you is that net. The phrase that follows launch into the deep. Jesus says these very words. Let down your net for a drag. You are that fisherman. The spirit within you is that net. Jesus is saying to you, launch out into the deep beyond your normal tradition, be no, beyond what you think is normal for Christianity. Launch out into the deep and let down your spirit and be filled. Be filled. And you can row out there and you can say, this isn't going to happen. It's just, it's stupid. It's stupid. But if you will move beyond that and let down your net, God is able to fill you. I'm talking about letting down your religious guard and everything that you know, everything that you could use as an argument to explain away the baptism of the Holy Spirit, every argument that you have in your mind about how it's not useful or how it's not necessary for today, you can dismiss all of that let down your guard, put your net in the water, and be filled. Because he says so. Because he says so. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, and in Judea, and in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. We cannot miss those instructions because we know these disciples had a relationship with Jesus. We know that they had knowledge, stacks of notebooks to be sure. What did they lack? Power. Launch out into the deep. Let down your nets. If I could speak this truth powerfully to you this morning, that God is saying to us, there's more. How many of you, as we were singing the songs, you felt something different here this morning? You felt there was like, what happened? I felt it. Something was not normal. Something is different. And it's because we here have been asking God, is there more? And he is saying to us, launch out into the deep, let down your nets for a drag. And we've stood at the precipice of the lake saying, I don't know about this. I'm not quite sure about this. But God, if you say so, I'm going to take a step in this direction. And I believe if we will step in this direction, we can honestly wave the palm branches and say, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Not talking about a king that we read about, but a king that we have experienced. It makes all the difference when you hold the palm branch and, and can say, I've experienced the king. Otherwise, if you wave the palm branch today in tradition, only a week later you'll be willing to cry out, crucify him. Crucify him. Which is what that same crowd did. The same crowd that welcomed him in Jubilee was the same crowd that yelled crucify him. We are all victims of that. We have all raised our hands in glorious praise to God and said, Sing to the king who is coming to reign. 
We've raised our hands in glorious submission and gone out and crucified him all over again. But so that we do not do that, Jesus says this, launch out into the deep. Let down your nets for a drag and you will be filled. Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. From the command to the filling, 10 days, 10 glorious days of waiting. You say to yourself, what, what exactly did they do for 10 days? They had a business meeting, aren't those always fun? They had to be bored out of their minds to have a business meeting. Who, who likes business meetings? Jack, you're the only one. I don't. I, I just wish business would take care of itself and just keep on rolling. But you know what? During this 10-day incubation of the church, they have a business meeting. Judas had committed suicide and they said, well, there's supposed to be 12 of us and now there's only 11. We need to vote in a new apostle. It's kind of funny. It's almost comedic in its approach to God because they vote in this guy by the name of Matthias and we never hear from him again. I mean, you can read the Bible from Acts chapter 1 forward. You never hear this guy. They replace Judas with a man-made attempt. And nothing comes of it. But when God shows up in the room, you hear the rest of that story. So there's this twofold attempt. They're trying to get on God's page. Have you ever tried to get on God's page? And you try to do something spiritual? That's what's happening in Acts chapter 1. A group, a group of guys just trying to get on page with God, and they're like, well, we need to replace a leader. And they even use scripture to back it up. I mean, that's, that's amazing. But they do it. And then what? Once the business meeting's over, now what? We've got nine days and 20 hours left. What are we going to do now? If you go back in your Bibles, look at Acts chapter 1. Sorry, Acts chapter 2. Verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. What, what had happened? They moved from doing things to try to get close to God and they came in unity knowing that they could do nothing for God unless His Spirit came. They came together in one accord and said, here we are, God. We don't know what we're doing. Isn't that a, a wonderful place to be? To just say, God, I don't have a clue what you want me to do. But I'm here anyway. I'm ready to launch into the deep. I've got my net here. I'm ready to throw it down. I don't know what I'm doing. This goes against everything I'm familiar with, but I'm here. And 120 of them had come to that mindset in one place in Jerusalem. I think that's profound. Verse 2. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire and one sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What a weird set of verses. The sound of a, a cyclone rushing through the wind, a rushing sound of wind, but their garments don't flutter. It's the sound sound of a train rushing past you but you don't shake just the sound 
the sound of power rushing through the corridors of space and time into that room. Not a hair out of place, but power has been unleashed. And then something even dramatic, more dramatic than we can even understand. As Gentiles in this century, reading the Bible, you read Acts chapter 2 and you're like, weird. Weird. That Could you imagine in this pitched roof here this morning, that a ball of fire just kind of danced above us, and then separated, and little tongues of fire danced over each of your heads. Weird. Weird, unless you've actually read the Old Testament and found that as the Israelites were leaving Egypt, they were led by cloud, smoke by day, and a pillar of fire by night. And if you read the account of when they come to the Red Sea, if you read it closely, you will find that as the sea is parted in front of them and the Israelites go through, a pillar of fire stands between Egypt and Israelites going free. So we fast forward into a room where disciples have gathered in one mindset and we have fire again. Now, we don't have to be brilliant here, but what is that fire? It's the abiding presence of Almighty God in the room, in physical format in which if you are an Israelite, particularly unschooled, uneducated, you are not looking to the written word. You are looking for Pictionary. You understand what I'm saying? Give me flashcards. I need a picture. And God gives these uneducated, unschooled, ordinary men a word picture that helps them understand what's happening. The wind that separated that Red Sea they know that story. That's the power of God. That wind came from heaven, tore through that Red Sea, and just separated it. We know that picture, God. But where's the fire? And no sooner can they get the words out of their mouth, a, a, a ball of fire appears in the room and separates and dances over each one, representing what? That not only just the, is the power there, but it now abides over each of you. What a profound picture, isn't it? Once you understand these individuals and their history, this makes all the sense in the world. This harkens back to moves of God that they've seen in the past. It always had wind and fire. It was always part and parcel to what God was doing. But don't miss it. Elijah tells us God's not in the fire and God's not in the wind. He is that small, still voice. So, so we, can, we can get all messed up and say, oh, God is the fire. God is the wind. God uses fire. God uses the wind to paint a picture but he's not fire or wind. He is sovereign creator of all things. He's not just wind or fire. He uses things to get our attention. He got their attention in that room and said, I'm here. I am present. And he filled them with his Holy Spirit. He then, it says, gave them tongues. The word is language. He gave them language as the Spirit gave them the ability to speak it.
Language is funny, isn't it? I didn't know Scrantonese was a dialect until I moved here. Yeah, that's... People talk funny around here. Until I opened my mouth and realized I talk funny too. And I imagine uneducated, unschooled individuals. Do you know anybody like that? They don't always use proper English, do they? There's a dialect, there's a style in which they speak. Call it urban language, call it street language, call it what you will, but people who have been uneducated and untrained don't speak well. These boys, when the Holy Spirit came upon them, began to speak in other languages. Other languages. They had a hard time with their own Hebrew. You understand. And now they're speaking the language of heaven. They're speaking the languages, what we're describing here, will tell us in just a few verses, will be the languages of men. Without prior practice, without going to the University of Jerusalem, they are speaking fluently the languages of other nations. What does this mean? Which is the exact question that those who are watching from the outside asked. What does this mean? Let's catch up to the to the scriptures, verse 5. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. You understand? Jews were scattered. You, you understand your history, right? Jews were scattered and they were coming back for the celebration. They were already in town for, for Passover. That was 50 days prior to this event. 50 days after Passover is Pentecost. They were here for a celebration. They just stayed for 50 days. It was like a party. And Jerusalem was packed. I mean, find a hotel. No way. They're sleeping in tents. They filled every possible spot you can in Jerusalem. This is high feast, high celebration. Every Jew from every nation has come back to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover and to celebrate now Pentecost. So when Pentecost had fully come, this was a big, high, big deal. Big crowds were out at the synagogue. Big crowds had come out to celebrate Pentecost. So you know what it's like. I mean, I, I guess the best thing that we can even equate it to is when a bunch of people gather down there in Scranton and paint themselves green. And, and, and we have this giant parade down there, right? For the Irish. St. Patrick's Day. It's the biggest thing that we can even kind of gather around in terms of community festivity. Unless you want to go to the Blueberry Festival in, in Montreux. I, you understand. There are things that pull people together. So this thing happens. Crowds, I'm talking thousands, have gathered in Jerusalem. And all of a sudden, this powerful thing happens to this small group of people. 120 of them. So the crowd has to react. And that's what we see in verse 5. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when the sound occurred... The multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speaking in his own language. What did they hear? They heard these unschooled, ordinary guys that spoke Scrantonese speaking the oracles of God in their own language. Powerful, isn't it? Verse 7, 
They were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya adjoining to Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. Isn't that amazing? I mean, you could be sitting here today and God is saying to you, launch out into the deep and you're saying, that doesn't make any sense to me, God. And he says, let down your guard. Just let down your guard and I will fill you with power. And I know what you're thinking. I don't want a tongue of fire dancing above my head. I mean, that'll just look so weird when I go to work or when I'm shopping. Look, it's not about a tongue of fire dancing above you, it's not about the wind. That was just a picture so they would equate what was happening with their own history. The powerful part is when the Holy Spirit comes and indwells upon you, people will marvel around you and say to themselves, this is amazing. What is going on? And that's when you, empowered by the Holy Spirit, will be able to respond to culture. Let's read further. Their question was this. So they were all amazed, verse 12, and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? I love the King James again there. It says, what meaneth this? Some of my favorite phrases in the Bible. What meaneth this? Others, mocking, said they're full of new wine or they're drunk. Talk about your opposition. Talk about interpretation. People from the outside watching this event came to some conclusions. I don't know when the last time you went to church and then left and people assumed that you had been drinking. I don't know when the last time you had that experience, but these boys had that experience. They had been with God and the interpretation around them was they'd been drinking. They're drunk. Amazed. So some are questioning. There's some inquiry. What does this mean? And others are saying, ah, you know those guys are just a bunch of drunks. Which brings forth Peter. You know the guy that Jesus told to launch out into the deep. Peter steps front and central. Because Peter has just been through it. He's the guy that certainly launched into the deep. He's picked up. He's seen the miracles. He's seen the signs. He has been with Jesus. But he's the same coward that denied him when Jesus was in court. Same guy. Now the coward that denies him at the crucifixion is the guy that stands up totally different and preaches to the crowd that ask, what meaneth this? And those that are saying they're drunk. Peter is a different man. Peter has also spoke in the languages of the world. And I just want to say a little side note on that. Do you have to speak in tongues? Do you have to? My first response to that is, do you have to? Why wouldn't you ask, do I get to? Do I get to speak in another language for God? Now let me give you this little story. Uh, Dr. Mark Rutland, who was the president of Southeastern College while I was there, shared his testimony with us in chapel one day. He was a world evangelist meaning that he went to the four corners of the world preaching the gospel. 
preaching everywhere. But he always needed an interpreter. As an English-speaking person, he always needed an interpreter. You can't possibly know the languages of the world, correct? He came to a crusade in which he was one of many speakers. It was a completely Spanish group in front of him. And it wasn't his turn to preach. He was just there to be a part of the service. Someone comes and whispers into the ear of Dr. Rutland. Uh, Dr. Rutland, our speaker, has been unable to make it. Can you preach? And he said, I, I'd be honored to. I love to preach, except we have not lined up an interpreter for today because I wasn't scheduled to preach, and the man that was going to preach spoke in Spanish. So there's, there's a problem here. And the man whispers back into Dr. Rutland's ears, just preach, God will take care of it. He will tell us in his testimony that he got up to speak to this crowd. And he began to preach. And as he opened his mouth to preach, he spoke in perfect Spanish for two and a half hours. Do I have to speak in a language? You don't have to do anything. You don't have to do anything. The question is, God, what do I get to do? What, what, what do I get to do? What, what will be my privilege? Now, I'm telling you that when they spoke in languages, the people around them heard. They heard them speak in their language the glories of God. That's amazing because they had not practiced it. The same thing that happened to them happened to Dr. Rutland. Now I have not used that particular gift but at my infilling I did speak another language. A language that I use to this day. It's a language between me and God. You might not be able to discern it. I don't know exactly what I'm saying. But I pray it to God and all I know is that it's more powerful than when I try to articulate in English what God is doing in me. And it happened, this language was given to me when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, which I told to you happened to me last week. Now I want to finish that story. I was at the church... There was not a sermon on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but I knew I wanted what my brother and the rest of the youth group had. I went to my pastor. I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I didn't understand. I didn't have all the theology. All I know is that they said that I got slain in the Spirit and I was laying out up on the, the platform up there. I got up and said, what was I, sleeping? Uh, that's childlike. Childlike. No, you weren't sleeping. God hit you. I don't know. Laid you out on the floor. But I felt like the weight of the world. And, and you understand, a 12-year-old boy, what kind of weight of the world was on you? See, I grew up in a pastor's home. My mother's here. She can verify the story. But divorce just shredded our family. And my dad was in the ministry and Whenever you're in a divorce like that, because he was cheating on my mother with someone else, he was not allowed to be a pastor anymore. And so publicly, my father was dismissed and publicly dismissed from church. And my mother had the courage to keep bringing me and my brother back to that church week after week after week. The non-quitter mentality within my mother says, we're pressing on. Your father made a mistake. We forgive him, but we're pressing on. So at 11, 12 years old, I had this damage that I was going to rise up in the ministry and I was going to serve with my dad. You, you understand how a kid's mind works? My dad's a pastor. I'm going to be a pastor. Boy, it'll be great when we serve together and it will be wonderful and glorious. And all that was just ripped to shreds. And all I knew is that I felt the weight of all of that. Even though none of it was mine to carry. I felt the weight of all of that.
But when I was filled with the Holy Spirit, when I got up the floor of the platform, all that was gone. It was still a reality, but the weight was gone. I went home and I laid down in my bed and I said, God, thank you. And as I wanted to articulate more back to God, I started to speak in a language that I can't even begin to describe to you except to tell you it was tongues. The Holy Spirit had so transformed me that I as a child without anybody teaching me about tongues spoke in tongues. And it is a, it is a way that I have communicated with God from then until now. That when there's just not enough words to say, when I can't quite grasp and articulate what I need to say to God, he just go to that language. And I don't know what's happening, but something powerful and amazing is happening. Because in that, I know that the Holy Spirit has filled me, and it is powerful to change lives and situations and people around me for the glory of God. What does it mean? Verse 14. Peter standing up with the eleven raised his voice and said, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk as you suppose since it's only the third hour of the day. But this was what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. Blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, the man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst. And as yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see this, this corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn an oath to him, that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing, the spoke, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into heavens, but he said to him, says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know, assuredly, that God has made this Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and Peter, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What does it mean? What does it mean when a group of men begin to speak in another language and glorify God when they didn't have prior practice except for Peter to go back to scripture and say, the prophet Joel told us this day would come 
the Holy Spirit will be poured out. Young men, young women, old men, old women, they will receive the Holy Spirit and they will do what you now see in here. The question is, for us in this room, what should we do? What should we do? Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a drag. You are that fisherman. The spirit within you is that net. All of tradition, all of church history, all that you're familiar with stands in front of you. What you think about Pentecost, your opinions about Acts chapter 2, all of that stands in front of you. And you have to say this powerful word. Nevertheless, nevertheless, because you say so, I will let down my guard. I will receive what God has for me. I will receive power. Now I know this comes with a bunch of theological questions. Will I speak in tongues? I don't know. I don't know. But if you do, speak it out. Will you roll around on the floor? I don't know. I don't know. Will you swing from the chandeliers? Yes. I don't know. All I know is that when the power of God hit that room, people thought that they on the inside of the room were drunk. That's got to mean something. Stiff-armed, sit in your seat, suddenly lost in a celebration of a move of God. Not irreverent, just rejoicing. Such as when the disciples, or when the Israelites passed through that dry ground and got on the other side of the Red Sea. You can read it for yourself. They had a party. I mean, down and out dancing, celebrating, song singing, celebration of what God had done in delivering them. And I kind of think that when when Peter was released from the bondage of, re, uh, of, of turning away Jesus, he was released from that and now preaches empowered by the Holy Spirit. Peter is a new man, no longer hanging on to the bondage of his failures. And a celebration ensues. When I knew that I no longer had to, to, to carry the guilt of what had happened in the divorce of my parents and, and the stain of guilt, when I knew I didn't have to carry that anymore, celebration ensued. Something inside of me was different. And I think if the power of God were to hit you today, it's not about whether you roll around on the ground, whether you speak in other tongues, it's when you get up off the floor and walk out those doors, you no longer carry the burden of yesterday. You are now filled with power. Filled with the power of the Holy Spirit to move forward in what God has called you to do. And when someone tugs on your arm and says, what does this mean? What does this mean? It means that you have moved from just believing about God to now moving in the power of God that he has provided for you. I think it was said this, this way. There's no such thing as Pentecostal and non-Pentecostal churches. That would be like breathing and non-breathing human beings. If a church does not have the breath of the Spirit within it, it's dead. But if it has breath, it's alive. And there's something different about it. Now we can keep having classrooms 
or we can be the church of the living God. Moving in power. Will your living conditions change? Probably not. Will you, I don't know, be raised to, to speak to kings? Probably not. If you were here for Sunday school, you'll probably have to live in Nazareth for a while. You'll have to live your faith in front of people in Nazareth, which is dirty, scummy, but you live it in power. You live with a smile on your face because the joy of the Lord is your strength and not your circumstance. And the last question is, is it for us? Is this just some antiquated piece of scripture or is it for us here today? To which Peter addresses it in his own sermon. He says in verse 38, Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. That is water baptism. Repent, be baptized. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you, to your children, and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. I know theologians get all messed up and say, see, it's just for the Israelites. Not until you get to Acts chapter 10, and you meet an Italian man who gets filled with the Holy Spirit. And then you say, all right, God, you're just messing it all up now. Anybody can get it. Yes, that's the point. Any man, woman, child from any century speaking any language can receive this power from God. That's the point. To do ministry without power is like trying to vacuum this sanctuary and not plug in. It's not getting, I'm not getting anywhere. Maybe if I work harder. You're not getting anywhere. Plug in. Plug in and you will have power. So many churches run in the sweeper and they're not plugged in. You can watch them. and If you looked from outside the window and our windows were clear enough and I was running the sweeper and not plugged in, you would think I'm doing it. Look, he's doing it. He's running the sweeper. He's cleaning the floor. But upon closer inspection, you walk in the door, there's no motor running. Look at that dingbat. Maybe he's deaf. Maybe he doesn't know. But much of the church goes through the motions and no power. Oh, it looks just spectacular to the world but upon closer inspection when they actually come through the doors and their life has hit rock bottom they want to know are you going through the motions or do you have power to suck up the dirt and I want to say just plug into the outlet let down your guard and be filled with the spirit of God John, would you come? I've asked John to lead us in just a few more worship songs. And while these worship songs are playing, I just want to challenge you. If you have been going through the motions, powerless, and you want to be like these men, and you just want to launch out into the deep, and you want to let down your net, and you want to receive power, then just slide up to this altar. If you just want to stay in your seat and sing songs and, and be a spectator, that's all well and good. I'm not talking to you. But I, I'm talking to the one that says, I want to move from doing church to being the church. I want to move from powerless living to power-filled living. If you're here today and you're saying, that's me, that's the element I'm missing. I'm missing the infill of the Holy Spirit. I want to come.
This altar is open to you. I'm not going to make a play stage out of this. I'm going to stay as long as whoever's here wants to be filled. I'll pray with each of you. I, you know, in, in, in fact, just to wipe away any prediction, you don't have to stand here with your hands raised in a position where I can knock you down. I don't, even want, I don't want that to even be a fear. Come and kneel at the altar. Just come and kneel at the altar and let God do the work. God doesn't need you to be standing or sitting or kneeling to fill you. He can fill you whenever and however he wants. But I do believe that we need to pray together. It's constant in Scripture. When people were filled with the Holy Spirit, they prayed together. And they were filled. There was something about the touch. Something about someone having the Holy Spirit and touching another. We can read about it throughout the book of Acts. People are touched and they receive. Touched and receive. It's like a game of tag. Tag, you're it. And you pass on what God has given to you. So that's all I want to do. I want to touch my hand to your head and I want to pray with you. And if that's you, you want to come. This altar is open. Well, let's just stand together. Let's stand together and worship the Lord. Light of the world, you step down in the darkness. Open my eye, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you.
Cause I never want to go back to my old life I need you more More than yesterday need you, Lord More than words can say Cause I never Right here in your presence is where I belong. Now my broken heart is fine, found a home, and I'll never be alone. I need you more. more.
Thank you. 